Good morning. Welcome to First Union Church. It's good to see each and every one of you today. For a morning scripture today, it comes from Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20, 20 through 22. My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Your mother's teaching. Bind them always to your heart. Fasten them around your neck. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you're awake, they will speak to you. All right. Let's go to number 658, number 658 in the suite, by and by, number 658.
I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. If you're able to, I ask you to stand. We do this in the honor of the reading of God's Word. We do this because this is Holy Scripture. Matthew chapter 7, this will be verses 1 to 6. A very familiar passage, and yet, quite honestly, a passage with great potential to be offensive if people will not hear what the Lord is trying to say to us. With that in mind, here is the Scripture passage. This is the word of the Lord. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a, a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, and then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls and turn and attack you. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, this morning we're actually beginning Matthew chapter 7 in this series on messages from the Sermon on the Mount, perhaps Jesus' most famous discourse. Because it is so well known, it has the potential for us to tend to just sort of gloss it over. When we do that, we miss so many of the gems that are contained in this passage. Remember, these were words spoken by Jesus himself. Now, I should begin this morning by noting that that opening line that in the classic translation is worded, judge not, that ye not be judged, this is one of the passages of Scripture that I think is, is often taken out of context. As followers of Jesus Christ, we should realize that we, of course, need to make certain judgments as part of showing right wisdom and discernment each day. There are just far too many cases, however, in which people, even people who profess to be Christian believers, don't use good judgment. They live in ways that are irresponsible. And then they will even try to claim that the Bible says God will always protect them from any natural consequences for their choices. But I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. I think that what he's trying to say to us is we need to watch our attitudes towards fellow believers who may have significant challenges in their life, perhaps due to unwise choices they've made, perhaps because of just unfortunate circumstances, but they are now seeking to make correction for that. Jesus is not prohibiting the use of proper judgment. He's telling us, don't be so judgmental. He's telling us, examine our own motives and actions first. The things that bother us when we see them in other people are very often the traits that bother us in ourselves. They reveal the attitudes and the behaviors that we wish that we could change in ourselves. If we aren't careful, we fall into what's really called a, an unintentional modern-day Pharisee mindset. We can't seem to fix something in ourselves, so we go on a mission to fix it in everybody else. Jesus is saying we need to uh, realize this because if we don't, we can actually do significant damage to people who are fellow believers. Now, as we look at the structure of the passage here, the previous couple of messages in this series, Jesus had statements of caution, warnings even. He was speaking of a biblical wisdom that centers on God's plan for our relationships with other people. The focus here in chapter 7, moves from fellow believers in the first five verses to people who are not yet believers in verse 6. So let's look at the outline here before we dig into the passage too much. The first five verses are really a prohibition against being so judgmental towards fellow believers without a proper love and concern. And then verse 6 is really it's a restraint against sharing the gospel with people who are so hostile to the gospel. So we're going to go verse by verse, and then we'll deal with some practical applications here. Like the end of chapter 6, the first five verses in chapter 7 describe what really is a, it's a warning. It's a warning against holding a judgmental attitude toward other believers. It doesn't say we shouldn't be discerning in evaluating right and wrong. But what it speaks against is a, is a looking down on a fellow believer who's struggling, a, a criticizing them without, this is the key, without a proper loving concern. 
I think it's a reminder God doesn't look approvingly on us when we do that. And in some ways, this mirrors what Jesus said about forgiveness earlier in chapter 6, right from the Lord's Prayer. And forgive us our debts, or trespasses, if that's our preferred translation, as we forgive our debtors. The key aspect in both statements of Matthew 7, 1 and Matthew 6, 12 is Christian love. Both contain a humility that says, I care enough about you to want to help you, but I'm not going to do it for you. Besides, in the future, you may need to help me if I wander off course. So that's really what this caring should communicate. Now, as described here, there should be no sense of superiority, no sense of superiority in which we try to make ourselves look good at the expense of others. And I think the passage is at least somewhat connected to one of the Beatitudes from the beginning of Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the merciful. Why? For they shall obtain mercy. All of these matters are part of what, there was a term in Latin, lex talionis. It meant the law of retribution. So what is this law of retribution? Well, it's, it's spoken of in Matthew chapter 7, verse 2. The passage where it says, you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And the same principle is repeated in two different directions. The absence of mercy and love in the way we treat others results in a lack of reward from God at the final judgment. This doesn't affect salvation. A saved believer is a truly saved believer. But it could very well affect the matter of our crowns and our rewards in heaven. James chapter 2 speaks of this. James chapter 2 verse uh, 12 and 13, it says, So whatever you say and whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you've been merciful, God will be merciful to you when he judges you. This is dealing with fellow believers, fellow believers who are saved, but it's more of an evaluation of our rewards in eternity. God expects us to treat fellow believers decently and in a civil way. In fact, the case can be made that if someone holds a consistently, and I mean consistently, judgmental, condescending, spiteful attitude towards fellow believers, that is not a descriptor of a true believer in Jesus Christ. If you look at the rest of Matthew 7, 2, and I'm going to quote from the classic translation, it says the following, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, ye shall be measured to you again. Now, in the first century, people would have recognized this as a Jewish proverb. And it's actually spoken in Mark 4.24. Here's what it says there. It says, Take heed what ye hear, and what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. Really, what it's talking about is these were the grain contracts of the day. Grain contracts. Boy, we really jumped ahead somehow or another there in the slides. I don't know how in the world that happened. There we are. That's where we need to be at the one that says the grain scoops. A measure was the weight or the scoop used to measure out the goods purchased. It came to represent the way that we treat other people. This should be the slide that has the picture of a scoop on it. There it is. See, it becomes the standard by which we judge others. The implication is that this becomes the standard by which God judges us. It's a pretty stark reminder that until the Holy Spirit softens the hard hearts of some people, this will be a challenge, at least at points in our lives. Now, in verse 3, Jesus expands on this issue, and he has this interplay between the speck and the figurative plank. This is verse 3. And this is in the classic translation. There it is again, a double. There we go. I think we're finally settling in. The classic translation says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, and considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Uh, this mote, by the way, that Jesus speaks of, is not the device we use to control electronic devices. In our house to this day, we still refer to it as the mote, because our daughter, Emily, who is visiting today, referred to it as the moat when she was little, and we still call it the moat. 
This is not what Jesus is speaking of. He's talking about a small issue. Um, a small issue in a person's walk of faith. A stunning contrast to the beam, the log, the plank, the tree trunk that's in someone else's eye. Jesus is using an element of sarcasm, but he's also got a very pointed rebuke to some of the Pharisee-like attitudes that he encountered. The passage is funny, and yet it's intensely pointed. And I would also share with you that by the use of the term brother, there, it, it just will not stay with one click, guys. It needs to be the one right there. The use of the term brother, verse 3, adolphos in Greek, he's talking about fellow believers, our relationship with fellow believers, the kind of judgmental attitudes he's speaking of towards fellow Christians are very harmful to the cause of Christ. Now notice, please, the contrast between the speck in one person's eye and the figurative log in another person's eye. We, we obsess over a tiny flaw in another person and we conveniently overlook our own sometimes very significant shortcomings. Jesus in verse 4 restates verse 3 for emphasis. And I think at different points we've run across this ourselves. It happens in different settings, but it happened 2,000 years ago. Jesus is pretty emphatic in saying to the person very straight out, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam from thine own eye, then thou shalt see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. This comes from denying our own faults when we look down on someone else and we criticize them without a proper loving Christian concern. Jesus is saying, once you've dealt with your own problems, you're going to have clear sight to help the other person. And by the way, the emphasis is on help. Is it helpful? That's really the key point. <laughs> we are going to have to deal with that issue, guys. Is it helpful? Now, please hear me. When we're pointing out the moat or the speck in someone else's eye, it may very well be real. It may be an issue that does need to be addressed. But the problem is when the person pointing it out is one willing to recognize the tree trunk in their own eye, the plank that's actually enlarged by their own pridefulness. Very often, they don't really want to help the other person. They want to point out how much better and wiser they think they are than everyone else. But Jesus says they're a hypocrite. They can't even face their own issues. I've worded it this way before, and so I'll phrase it again. They not only deny their issues, they deny that they deny their issues. They treat the other person who has the moat in their eye as if they're the ones with the beam. But you know, this can happen in ways that are more subtle, too. It happens when people overreach. When someone basically decides they know better than everyone else, and they don't have all the information but they end up inserting themselves into a situation where they don't have confidential information that others have, and the outcome is rarely a good thing. Friends, please hear me. The, the beam in your eye may be wrapped in good intentions, but the outcome is rarely good. We need to get the beam out of our own eye first. Now let's look at verse 6, because this is tricky. I'll let you advance it, Daniel. There we go. Verse 6, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. It's an antithesis statement, much like earlier chapters. Now, Jesus is now turning to the opposite setting of verse 1 to 5. In verse 1 to 5, he's describing how we sometimes have too much judgment. In verse 6, he's saying, Be careful. Sometimes you don't use enough good judgment. Now, my understanding of this passage is speaking of outreach and mission settings. And he uses some terms, sacred, luxurious, and he uses examples of things that are holy, and he refers to pearls. 2,000 years ago, pearls were considered more precious than even diamonds. They were the epitome of luxury. But you notice where it says, and in many translations it uses this word, it says, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Now the term dogs 
was the same term that the Jews used to refer to unrepentant Gentiles. Unrepentant Gentiles. The Greek term kion, it, it meant a religious corrupter. When it's saying dogs, he's not talking about our, our furry friends today. Like my buddy Pepper here. This is Pepper, our miniature schnauzer. She's the very annoying barking machine that you hear anytime you walk outside of the manse. He's not talking about the animals that we know and that we love. He's talking about probably wild wolves. Aggressive and hostile. They'll kill you by their very nature. Swine that he speaks of are probably not barnyard animals. They're probably more like wild boars. In the biblical context, this is speaking of animals that were viewed as some of the most filthy on the planet. So his use of the term dogs and swine is emphasis that we need to use great discretion and care when we're ministering to people who are so aggressively resistant to the gospel. They are the religious corruptors that he warns us against. And the point is that when we're talking about intensely unrepentant unbelievers, they will not just fail to respond, they will persecute and oppress those who do believe. Jesus is cautioning us about people who re respond to the gospel with a, with a vicious scorn and a hardened contempt. He says, be prayerful, be careful, be wise. Use great wisdom. So let's wrap this up. Here in the Sermon on the Mount, in a way that is continuing to be very consistent with what Jesus said earlier, he's telling us at least three things. One, it's not pleasing to God when we have a spiteful, judgmental attitude towards other believers who have problems in their life. Our attitude should be a desire to help them. We're not going to do it for them, but it should be a proper, loving Christian concern. And we should be praying for them. We should be praying for them. Second point, even when the speck in the other person's eye is accurately identified, the person who obsesses about it is often a hypocrite because their attitude is so inappropriate and inconsistent with the traits we're supposed to have as followers of Jesus. And then finally, verse 6 speaks to the need to recognize that when we're ministering to those who do not yet believe, we have to realize until the Holy Spirit changes their hearts, some of those people will turn and hurt you and hurt others who also believe. Jesus is advising great care in this area. Now, this doesn't mean we shouldn't support missions. Quite the contrary. It doesn't mean we shouldn't seek ways to share the gospel with those who do not yet believe. Obviously, we should be doing that. And there are churches that emphasize something that they use a term. They call it soul winning. Each church should have a desire to do this in their own way. But in some cases, this in the last 30 or 40 years, has morphed into something that looks an awful lot like the works of men and women who try to boastfully take credit when they make statements like this. And I've heard people make these statements. Not here, but in Gaylord, I heard people make these statements. They weren't from my church, but they were from another church in town. The statements were like this. They would say, I won four souls to Christ in the last month alone. How many of you won? Now, if the people they speak of truly came to a saving faith, well, praise God. But the person who boasts about it has a beam in their eye. You know why? They haven't won anybody to Christ. Only the Holy Spirit does that. We have to remember there is a distinction between the Creator and the created. He's God, and we're not. So with that in mind, and as you can tell, that's one that gets under my skin. <laughs> so yes, there's just one more thing today. It's a question that we all need to ask ourselves. Do you have a beam in your eye? Do I have a beam in my eye? Can you think of something that gets under your skin so much that it affects you to the point where you literally can't even see straight? And when you're trapped in its claws... That's when you notice all of the imperfections in the lives of other believers. You start to point something out to them, and you might be accurate. But at the same time, there's something very troubling in your own life that you're not willing to face. So yes, help a fellow believer with that speck in their eye, that relatively minor imperfect, imperfection in their walk of faith. But 
Don't be a hypocrite. Get the tree trunk out of your own eye first, and then you can properly and lovingly speak to others regarding the speck in their own eye. I think this is what Jesus is trying to say to us this morning. Capiche? All right, let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, this is a message that is the very words you spoke, and I, Lord, I'm asking that I represented it properly and I didn't misuse it. Lord, I'm just asking that each of us, me too, especially me, that you will help us to recognize when we have a beam in our own eye, that your Holy Spirit will move mightily to help remove that beam, that will answer your command to get the beam out of our eye, and that we will properly and lovingly want to help fellow believers, not do it for them, but to help them, and that you'll open their hearts to be receptive to hearing what it is that your word teaches, to show them when they've wandered off course. And Lord, that you'll help us to not be so judgmental, but at the same time that you'll help us to use good judgment and good wisdom as we share our faith carefully and wisely. And Lord, may it be effective, because the purpose is to call people to a saving faith, not to drive them away. Lord, today as we honor our our mothers and those who have filled the role of our mothers, may we always have a great compassion for those who struggle with that role, either because they have lost a child along the way, or because they always wanted to be a mother and For one reason or another, it has not yet happened. Lord, may they know that you love them, and may they know that you have a plan for their life, that your plan is perfect, and that they will trust you for all things, including every moment of their life, just as they trust you for their place in eternity. We just ask you bring them a sense of peace and a sense of love, and that we as the family of God would come around our mothers everywhere to have them know that they are loved and that they are appreciated. We ask this, Lord, in your holy name. Amen.